Many of us have found ourselves lacking a formula for dissemination and implementation science. And today, Dr. Mark McGovern is going to illuminate a pathway forward. Dr. McGovern is professor of psychiatry and of medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine. He's co-chief of the Division of Public Mental Health and Population Sciences and director of implementation research in psychiatry and the medical director of integrated behavioral health in the Division of Primary Care and Population Health. He's the director of the Center for Behavioral Health Services and Implementation Research, which is the organizational hub for three national federally funded centers focused on dissemination and implementation science. One is the Center for Dissemination and Implementation at Stanford. This is a NIDA P50 Center of Excellence. Also, uh, the Research Adoption Support Center. This is funded by an NIH HEAL grant, a U2 grant. And then third, the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, which is funded by SAMHSA and the US Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. McGovern also facilitates a Stanford University network for dissemination and implementation research known as Sundir, a grassroots transdisciplinary transdepartmental group that meets monthly. So Dr. McGovern is gonna be speaking to us for about 45 minutes and then we'll have time for Q&A as Ashley mentioned. So please just chat in any questions that you have for Dr. McGovern. And with that, um, Dr. McGovern, I'd like to turn it over to you. The floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Dr. Na Darnell and uh, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for joining, uh, joining us today. I'm gonna try to navigate the screen share so that you can see some slides. I hope uh, I hope you can all see the beginnings of that. Perfect. Okay, good. Well, yeah, I think uh, you, one of the uh, things that I wanted to call your attention to first is that uh, I, I won't necessarily be talking about pain or pain relief. Hopefully I won't be uh, contributing to anyone's pain or a cause of pain. Uh, throughout the presentation today, but I, I will be talking about innovation and uh, really the translation of innovation into routine care, routine practice settings. So particularly for people who are uh, innovators, uh, intervention developers, uh, intervention, intervention evaluators, uh, and really uh, thinking about the end game, if you will, uh, I, I hope uh, what I'm gonna talk about is relevant. So yeah, I, I, I love this slide. This is uh, really sort of conveys the, the idea that uh, particularly of those groups of folks, uh, often the question is, are, are we making an impact? Sure, you know, we've come up with some brilliant ideas, uh, perhaps even found them to be effective, uh, found them to be efficacious on a small scale, but we realize perhaps that uh, they're not uh, they're not widely uh, implemented into routine care settings. So some People actually care uh, a great deal about the translational uh, uh, benefit or uh, outcomes of their interventions and others sadly are really just interested in developing uh, interventions uh, and getting grants and publishing papers uh, and really you know, kind of looking for the, the maximum effect size and differences between their particular intervention and a control condition. So the first thing I want to do is try to uh, demystify uh, DNI science. And the first order of business is really, I think if you Google DNI now uh, versus if you Googled it uh, about 20, uh, uh, about two years ago, even uh, DNI, if you Google now, uh, probably comes up with uh, diversity and inclusion. And uh, I think uh, th this is awesome. Uh, and, and and it's added to a little confusion when people do talk about DNI. So hopefully, if you saw this announcement, um, you know, you'll you'll recognize that this is predominantly about dissemination and implementation science, although a huge component and overarching uh, uh, approach within DNI has to do with matters of equity. And I'll I'll talk more about that later. We really want to think about innovations and translation of innovations in an equitable way. So I think uh, there are some uh, there are some uh, kind of updated information I can share with uh, with you about that. Also, there's often confusion between implementation the word versus implementation the approach. And 
implementation the word really has to do with i i implemented my intervention uh within the context of a clinical trial you know comparing it uh, versus uh, control with you know 200 uh people who were randomly assigned so yes there is an implementation taking place but it's not really an examination of how that intervention may be translated into real world situations. The other uh, issue that's frequently uh, confusing to folks is if frameworks, if you begin to scratch the surface of DNI science uh, or preparing grants, uh, you'll hear about frameworks. And I, I kind of want to demystify and uh, kind of simplify some of that for you. The third area is implementation strategies. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, some of you may be looking to design studies or have heard about hybrid approaches, uh, sometimes misnamed hybrid designs. They're not really designs, they're really approaches. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And then I, I, I also want to address when you might think about DNI in your work. And this could be, you know, if you're a bench researcher or you're a clinical trialist or you're an intervention developer or even a clinician, a, a health systems leader. Uh, or you already have uh, significant uh, grant funding to do uh, uh, effectiveness kind of research. So uh, that's what I plan to be able to cover uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I hope I get there. This is actually uh, a really important slide. And uh, I, I, essentially, uh, it's pure thievery from a colleague of ours, Jeff Curran, who's uh, on the faculty of the University of Arkansas Medical School um, in the College of Pharmacy. And he, he's really uh, published a really uh, awesome paper about implementation science made simple, some really, really simple teaching concepts. And, uh, you know, Jeff uh, sort of lays it out this way that uh, when we talk about implementation science, the intervention practice innovation is the thing. Effective, effectiveness research really evaluates the thing Implementation research looks at how to help people uh, or places do the thing. Implementation strategies are the kind of things that we do, the techniques, uh, you know, the interventions that we do to try to help people do the thing in their everyday work. And implementation outcomes have a lot to do with how much or how well they do the thing. So I'll explain a lot more about these uh, <laughs> these things, but. Uh, it's really critical to, to know the difference between an intervention or an innovation and implementation strategies. So if you can make that distinction, uh, you know, at the end of this 45 minutes, you'll be much further along than, than many people. So the traditional research paradigm, as you probably know, is to really try to come up with the best new thing. You know, the thing that works uh, better than what's already there maybe the thing that's more efficient, the thing that's more specific, more targeted, uh, more user-friendly, uh, the thing that generates the biggest effect size. So a lot of our clinical trials compares things one, thing one versus things two, uh, and this is transdiagnostic, right? So it could cut across any disease, any problem, any healthcare situation. You know, we're trying to find a better way of doing things. Uh, sometimes we like to do mixed methods work, which I'm really, I mean, qualitative work where we interview people who might be delivering the intervention, who might be receiving the intervention, i.e. patients uh, paying for the intervention, uh, members of the community where the intervention may take place. So we, we, we might consult with those people and do qualitative work in the development, the improvement, refinement, the adaptation. So a simple uh, Theodore Dreisel, uh, Dr. Seuss example, comparing thing one and thing two. This is another way of thinking about it, uh, really opening up uh, black boxes, uh, re really think about the Russian nesting dolls where in traditional effectiveness uh, projects, we, we take unproven interventions or their delivery platforms, let's say, uh, for an example, uh, 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 cognitive behavioral therapy for pain, maybe uh, that's a proven intervention, but maybe we want to adapt that proven intervention uh, through uh, using an app or, or a technology uh, delivery platform. So it's still a proven intervention. We've adapted it, and we're really interested in, you know, does it improve symptoms? Does it improve functioning? Uh, so that's a standard effectiveness paradigm. 
more it, it, implementation approaches often will open up uh, that black box between the intervention and the outcomes and really begin to look at, you know, what are the kind of things that might influence uh, those outcomes or uh, you know, what are the kind of things that might influence the adoption of that intervention uh, within uh, that kind of linear framework of uh, intervention to outcome. So it kind of opens up the first uh, black box, the first doll within the Russian nesting doll. The last black box is what we call a advanced implementation research paradigm, which is really where the DNI field is today, which is opening that final, and maybe not final, but maybe the current uh, black box where we're looking at the implementation strategies, which are designed really uh, to, to leverage uh, contextual determinants, the systems, the organizations, the individuals who are involved in the interventions delivery, and uh, what are the kind of things that might really uh, 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 precipitate, cause, leverage implementation outcomes and also patient level outcomes. So you can see as you go down from tier one to tier three, you start with unproven interventions, but then you get to uh, proven interventions. The, the focus on uh, really dissemination and implementation uh, has a lot to do with once interventions are proven, but that's not to say that even if you have an unproven intervention, you should not be thinking about uh, uh, really looking at implement implementability even from the beginning. So quick uh, pivot to uh, frameworks and DNI science. I think this is the kind of thing that is often mind boggling. And as a grant reviewer uh, uh, on NIH study sections, this is usually the kind of uh, issue that gets people into trouble uh, if they are uh, talking about uh, using DNI science within the context of their application. And the trouble usually is that they either misapply or just slap on a DNI framework without really, uh, really doing it in, in in a way that's you know uh, that's proper uh, or really a, a a good fit. So that there are really three types of frameworks: meta frameworks, if you will, determinant, process, and evaluative. And this is based on a a really nice paper by Per Nielsen, uh, which really organizes the frameworks into these three larger buckets. An example of a determinant framework uh, is the CIFR, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. Uh, we've often heard in improvement work in health systems that culture eats strategy for breakfast, and this is really about context can eat an intervention or an innovation uh, before it really gets out uh, of the starting gate. So we really want to understand, characterize inventory context and culture in a way so that we can anticipate things that might accelerate or undermine uh, its translation into a real world setting. And the CIFR is as, as good as uh, a framework as any. It's probably the most frequently used. Uh, in, in many ways, it's quite simple. Uh, there are five different uh, levels or five different dimensions, the characteristics of the intervention or innovation, the outer setting, which is not to be confused with the outer limits, but really kind of the, the outer context, the the you know the community the health system you know the the state the county uh, you know within which an organization or inner setting uh, is situated so the inner setting may very well be a, let's say a, a safety net clinic in Oakland uh, and then the outer setting has to do with the the city of Oakland uh, you know the payers for the services maybe even state policy state regulations. Um, and, and the characteristics of the providers have a lot to do with the, the, the types of people who are going to be asked to deliver the intervention or those around them. Uh, also, I should mention uh, in the inner setting uh, it has a lot to do with the organization, things like leadership, culture within the organization, how the organization deals with new things and change, how stable, how re well resourced it might be. Uh, characteristics of the providers also include uh, workforce, uh, you know, is the workforce there, uh, is there shortages, is there turnover, uh, and the patient, uh, you know, the level, the degree to which the patient, you know, kind of the end user, the consumer of the intervention is considered uh, in terms of the, uh, the complexity, uh, you know, the grasp, the acceptability of the, of the intervention. Process frameworks, I think the, the, the original one is the diffusion of innovations by C. Everett Rogers. That's where uh, the idea that you know m many of us can be labeled anything from laggards to innovators with early and late adopters as categories in between. 
So uh, diffusion of innovations is really an early work idea about dissemination and implementation and actually pertains to agriculture and adoption of innovations pertaining to, to corn and, and agriculture. Uh, EPIS, uh, the exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment uh, phase uh, model really is developed by our colleague at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, Greg Ahrens, is also widely adopted and explains the different tasks and, and strategies that might be necessary based on the stage of a project. So exploration might be an early stage where a health system is exploring options you know, to address a concern or a health problem. Preparation is really lining up the resources or lining up the individuals who may be needed uh, to implement something. Implementation is that actual process where the, where the implementation uh, is taking place, typically anywhere from 12 to 24 months. And sustainment is you know, the life of the, uh, the intervention or, in, uh, or innovation after an active implementation period. So sustainment of all the phases is probably the least studied, uh, often uh, perhaps because that it, it, it extends beyond the life of any particular grant. So uh, it's an air, a wide open area and obviously levers like policy and financing have a lot to do with sustainment, but, uh, uh, but not always. There are, are other drivers of sustainment in addition to those two kinds of things. Evaluative frameworks, I think the best known, uh, there's a, another one, a, a, an Ola Proctor developed, uh, really just called the Proctor Taxonomy, but the REAIM uh, framework uh, developed by Russell Glasgow and refined by Rachel Shelton at the University of uh, Colorado, uh, really is probably the best known one. It's an acronym. Uh, I, I think DNI science is burdened with acronyms, and I've tried to reduce the number of acronyms I shared with you uh, today, but in some ways they're unavoidable as I introduce you to the science, but hopefully I've tried to keep the acronyms to a minimum. Uh, REACH is the, the patients who, uh, the, the proportion of patients who need or want the inter intervention or innovation that get it. So it's often a proportion, you know, a numerator being those that get it, a denominator being of those who need it or could benefit from it. Effectiveness is, you know, back to standard effectiveness or efficacy that it's it's been found to work. Adoption, the proportion of providers who could deliver it are actually delivering it. So we do projects looking at addiction medication uh, within the context of safety net clinics across the state of California. So our denominator are the number of providers within those organizations and the num numerator is the number of providers who are uh, prescribing uh, uh, addiction medication to patients with addiction disorders. Uh, implementation is often uh, adherence to a guideline or adherence to fidelity that the, that the intervention being, is being delivered as designed. Uh, and maintenance has it's really the same as sustainment. Are these uh, indicators of reach, effectiveness, adoption, and implementation being sustained beyond, often sustained beyond the two years or four years or five year you know, circus of a grant period. So, you know, once the tent and the uh, actors and the animals leave town, uh, is it actually transformed the town or is it the same as it ever was? So sustainment, again, is understudied uh, and often uh, the kind of area that, uh, that there's a, a need for more, more research. If you haven't seen this before, this is really, uh, I think, uh, unimpressive and tragic. And it's really... Uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, sort of documents the need in a way or highlights the need. And it, it, really, the story is simple. It takes 17 years for 14% of innovations to, uh, you know, to reach, uh, you know, public, uh, public health care. So uh, this is fairly, uh, you know, fairly tragic. Uh, you talk about a pipeline. This is a very leaky pipeline. It takes a long time to get things out from development. I can't think of anything else that operates in 17 years other than the, the appearance of cicada across the, uh, across the country uh, and, and the world, really. So bench to bookshelf, right? We, we come up with many of these innovations. Maybe many of us have, uh, have developed wonderful research careers, but our things have, uh, have really landed uh, in you know dusty and cobwebbed uh, bookshelves, uh, and again, although this figure is growing, 
DNI projects continue to be underrepresented in the, the federal uh, or US biomedical research budget. So what is to be done? Not, not the, uh, the Vladimir Lenin novel in the turn of the century, uh, but really what is to be done to improve this 17-year uh, uh, timeline to get things into routine care access. So the standard pipeline looks a little bit like this, where we start with efficacy, we move to effectiveness, you know, we get to implementation research, and presumably that leads to better, uh, better health care, better health, uh, better outcomes. Uh, what is to be done? Uh, there are hybrid effectiveness implementation approaches. I can uh, share a little bit about the, those. D4DIS, Design for Dissemination Approaches. We need to get better at DNI science. It's a relatively newer science. And then I think we, we are trying to do our part as an academic medical uh, institution to grow expert capability uh, in DNI science, the next generation, if you will, of DNI scientists. So hybrid approaches essentially are, are spatially between effectiveness and implementation research. They kind of fit right there. Uh, really three types of hybrids kind of weighted in the direction of increased uh, implementation, uh, implementation focus. Type one hybrid really looks at the, uh, the implementability of an intervention while testing its effectiveness. Type three is really focused on uh, less of an emphasis on effectiveness, but more of an emphasis on those implementation outcomes that the re-aim framework, let's say, might assess the reach, the adoption, you know, the implementation outcomes, and less that effectiveness part of the, of the acronym. And then type two literally are a balance between implementation and effectiveness trials. An implementation trial, and we have several up and running, are really designed to test the effectiveness and cost of implementation strategies, i.e. those things that we're doing to help people do the thing in their routine practice settings. I think this really explains, uh, you know, uh, visually uh, what I just uh, what I was just describing. Uh, where the weight goes uh, in hybrid one from one to hybrid three, just based on the degree of focus on implementation research versus effective research, effectiveness research. If you're a grant writer uh, or a developer of research, you often think about your specific aims, you know, the key aims page that, you know, captures uh, your reviewer. Uh, and if a, in a hybrid trial for a type one, again, the relative emphasis is on effectiveness. So two of your three aims would be effectiveness oriented. Type two, again, kind of split. The, you know, the scale is uh, held in the middle. And then type three, you might have uh, uh, two implementation aims and one, one effectiveness aim to just really document that your thing is still working and maybe working across the variety of contexts. We often are asked, and, and you probably have had an intervention uh, or been wondering about an intervention and how you might go about uh, inquiring uh, across uh, key, uh, key stakeholders, as we call them, oftentimes pe people who are involved in the delivery of the intervention, you know, leadership within a clinic or an organization. And this is a, a fairly standard interview guide, and I, I think Ashley will make these slides available uh, I think this presentation will be archived, uh, it was my understanding, so hopefully uh, you'll be able to, to cut and paste these kind of questions into an interview guide if, uh, if you choose to examine your intervention and the people who are using it and you know, kind of get an, a good idea, A, if it's, if it's likely to be a good fit, and B, if it's not, then you know, what are the adaptations you can make so that, so that it is a better fit, and obviously the sooner you start uh, these kind of inquiries, the better, uh, especially if you're thinking about co-design, you know, of an intervention. So these are some fairly straightforward questions. I won't, I won't uh, read them to you. Uh, implementation strategies I mentioned are the interventions of implementation. Uh, you know, quite clearly, the, the 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 methods or techniques that we use to 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 adopt, help people adopt or implement or sustain a program or practice. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in this area to really inventory uh, some of the major implementation strategies. You notice uh, at the bottom, uh, uh, Powell et al., their, their work was really one of the first to try to uh, document uh, uh, the, the, the list of common strategies and name them, really develop the terminology. As in the case with any emerging science, sometimes you need to start with you know, pragmatic definitions and terminology before you can advance the field. 
And it, really, the field, I think the, 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 the course of, uh, of DNI science right now is focused on uh, th this area, really ch ch choosing how to help people do the thing. And then this is a, really a bit of a current state. You know, these three examples, uh, th this is kind of what we typically do. And uh, this might have to do with really a large scale up projects that could be with across a health system or, you know, leveraging, uh, you know, federal dollars to implement anything from a vaccine uh, to, uh, you know, an evidence-based uh, treatment or an FDA approved medication. And the first implementation strategy is often a, a compilation of strategies, a kind of one size fits all approach where, you know, you decide that you're gonna do, uh, you know, training and expert consultation, or maybe a, a public service announcement and uh, that goes out and, you know, we, we sort of hope that it's gonna work. And the other approach, and I've been involved in many of these projects over the years where we provide, let's call it a buffet of uh, implementation supports, you know, from training to learning collaboratives, to, you know, lunch and learns, to uh, coaching, to uh, just about everything, uh, uh, auditing and feedback, giving people data, and really just throwing it all out there and you know crossing our fingers that you know something will stick and something will be the thing that the implementation support that you know helps people absorb the thing into their practice so that they can deliver it uh, with their patients and the most common of course is training when there, there's no evidence as an implementation strategy for the for the effectiveness of training it's always tr training may be more of an more of a necessary uh, uh, and maybe even a, a essential, but not complete. So I, I think the idea here is that training alone uh, is likely to be ineffective uh, as, a, as a singular implementation strategy. So the field is shifting, uh, you know, to really thinking about becoming more sophisticated, as I mentioned earlier, comparative implementation strategy trials. Uh, we're calling it precision implementation. Uh, you know, not this one size fits all or, you know, hit everyone with everything or train and pray. Uh, the next wave of DNI research, and these are the kind of uh, areas that this advanced uh, implementation research paradigm is operating in, really looking at trying to align strategies with a few different things to see if we can be much more, uh, much more specific and targeted in these implementation strategies, both in terms of effectiveness and in terms of research, resource allocation and cost. So one of the things that many of us are looking at are the context. So what are the aspects of the context and the CIFR, let's say the CIFR dimensions, different levels. If we do understand uh, what's happening in the context, maybe that would be uh, helpful as we think about our implementation strategies to kind of design the strategies based on contextual determinants. What is a stage? So what we might need to do initially is very different than what we might need to do later on. So there might be a lot of information sharing up front, and then there might be a lot of coaching, mentoring, uh, facilitation later on. And then even later on, there may be a lot of emphasis on uh, issues around financing and, poli uh, and policy making, and also institutionalizing, you know, a, a new a new practice. Shared decision making with stakeholders, so really sitting down with the people who are uh, part of a project who are going to be delivering the intervention, and really describing and discussing, uh, you know, what would work best in their organization, what would work best in their setting, and you know, really much like you would a shared decision making approach with patients, really coming up with a plan based on alternatives and options and really, really listening to the input of the people who are gonna be uh, charged with delivering the intervention as to what might work best from, from in, in their eyes. Phenotyping barriers and facilitators, I'll describe that a little bit more. I think well, this is really a, a ripe area for research. We are doing our best to try to study this where you really try to match the strategy to a barrier. So for instance, if there's a patient stigma, uh, which is often, I think, an area in, in pain and pain management. There's uh, patient stigma issues, uh, both self-stigma and provider-related stigma. Uh, so what are the implementation strategies that might be targeting stigma? And uh, is it training, new information, 
Probably not. Is it uh, sharing uh, testimony of people with lived experience? Uh, that might be more in the right in the right direction. So combating stigma, addressing stigma, reducing stigma. There may be a need for specific strategies to do that. And lastly, measurement based, which is an area that we're doing some work in, where we really uh, uh, have a targeted outcome. And you know, based on the achievement of that outcome, you know, we we uh, increase the intensity of uh, of implementation strategies. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But here's a, a, a kind of a logic model developed by our colleague at University of Utah, J.D. Smith, and colleagues, which really tries to kind of document. And you, you know, you can download and print this form uh, once you have the citation, or cut and paste from this slide and really fill in what are the key barriers and determinants along the five dimensions of the CIFR framework? What are the implementation strategies that are designed to address those, uh, those particular determinants? What are the purported mechanisms? So, uh, so I think I mentioned one, which might be you know stigma implementation strategy. What would be the best strategy for that? What is the purported mechanism? And what is the desired outcome? The desired outcome, again, could be based on the re-aim framework these outcomes in this illustration and the implementation research logic model are actually derived from the Enola Proctor taxonomy that I also mentioned as an example uh, implementation outcome or evaluative framework uh, example. Measurement-based implementation, we have a, a, a project underway in the state of Washington, uh, again, implementing addiction medications within the context of specialty and primary care. And we had recognized based on other work that we've been doing uh, in places like Vermont and New Hampshire and across California, that it would really be useful to think about a stepped care uh, model of implementation or a stepped implementation approach, just like you might manage hypertension where, you know, you use a, uh, you know, a blood pressure reading to determine your intervention. And basically, if a uh, if a patient is responding with, you know, self-management, lifestyle changes, maybe there's no need for medication, uh, and then you know, gradually increase the intensity of the intervention based on that target criteria. So we essentially doing the same uh, with an implementation support strategy. We start off with simple uh, data that we feed back to the participants. Uh, we then move based on how they do to a two-day training or workshop. If they achieve their target, then they're, uh, as I say at the bottom, they only get what they need. They enter a sustainment phase. If they don't, then they get increasingly uh, intense and costly rather support. So we have the development of an internal champion or the use of a coach or facilitator or consultant, and that's a randomized element to the arm. And then lastly, if none of those things are working, we make sure that they get kind of extra time with the coach or consultant or facilitator. And it's really, uh, it, it turns out to be an innovative approach to implementation. Uh, here's a little bit of a, a visual of the timeline. Uh, there turned out to be five different pathways. We're actually ending uh, quarter four. So we're uh, witnessing the uh, benefits of enhanced monitoring and feedback to the organizations. We have 76 uh, clinics that are participating in the project. So it's a fairly large a comparative implementation trial. But you might be saying, uh, yeah, but Mark, we not, we're not doing implementation. We're, you know, we're developing uh, interventions at this stage. I'm, I'm, I have an R21, you know, safety and practicality pilot, uh, where I'm collecting pilot data as part of a K, uh, K grant or a CDA if you work in the VA, or this is an R01. We barely have enough money to do what we're trying to do with an N of 200 or 400. Uh, so the idea here is that e even if you think you're not using implementation strategies uh, to help deliver the intervention, you probably are. And normally within the context of a trial, uh, it's resource in in intensive. You're paying clinics, you're incentivizing clinics, you're paying interventionists, you know, study physicians, you know, study clinicians, you're paying for care, you know, care is often free. Uh, you're, you might be even compensating patients for their assessments. Uh, labs and so forth. You're, you know, it's just, uh, you have people checking the protocol to make sure everything is going according to plan, which, by the way, it seldom does. And then most of these strategies uh, are not feasible once we think about translation to real world settings. So I think the idea here is that, you know, you really want to support 
or understand, I should say, uh, the strategies you're using, because those are the kind of things that as you think about variation across your protocol, uh, you can kind of identify where it's going well, where it's not going well, and maybe understand that, oh, oh, we're doing this with this group and it seems to be working well. So what what can we learn from that? And uh, the places of where it's not doing well, what kind of rescue did we have to do? And what ultimately, if we did that rescue, kind of salvage that part of the protocol in that particular site? So I think those backstories, which are often stories that aren't told, are really, really important from the perspective of, 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 of downstream translation. We actually have uh, been working as one of our centers, we've been working on a tool to help uh, research teams evaluate uh, the degree to which they're incorporating uh, DNI concepts or constructs within their work. Uh, it's called the Dissemination and Implementation Research Capability uh, Short Survey. Uh, really designed for a research team to self-evaluate and then to think about the different kind of things they could do to make enhancements, improvements. Again, like the, you know, like if you look at a list of restaurants, there's a kind of a $1 sign, a $2 sign, a $3 sign, a $4 sign that gives you an indication of how expensive the restaurant might be. Uh, some of these things are kind of $1 or no dollar signs, and some of them probably add up. Uh, so re really, uh, it's self-determined uh, how you would use this tool and what you would do based on the information that you uh, get fed back to you. Uh, but it might be pretty useful if you're a, a researcher. And you know, people often ask, when should I consider implementability? And my response is, well, pretty much now, uh, pretty much in the beginning. So now here's the issue about the when. Uh, the when is thinking about a hybrid trial. That's kind of your option one. And that's particularly if you've advanced the uh, your intervention, you know, beyond a stage one or phase one, and are really thinking about effectiveness. Another option is to really, really think about it from the early, uh, from the very beginning, and that's where the D four disc design for dissemination comes into play. So the D four disc has really been developed by our colleague at Washington University St. Louis, Ross Brownson, who's been for the most part a prevention and cancer researcher, uh, entered into the world of mental health fantastic colleague uh, and, and mentor, and also Bethany Kwan, who's uh, uh, who's at the University of Colorado as well. Uh, d 4 dis really uh, looks at implementability as early as you can. Uh, really, some of the same implementation uh, frameworks that I talked about or that I've been talking about are relevant here. Uh, the concept of co-design, you know, really bringing in the end user uh, at the very beginning and those of you that have had uh, funding through the PCORI, know that that's part of the PCORI uh, kind of ideology, if you will, uh, really bringing in the potential consumers to co-design, plan, evaluate, adjust, adapt as you go. And uh, you know, I think that that has been used uh, more like, I'll call it tokenism, uh, but really in, in, in D4DIS, it's a very an active uh, bi-directional process that's uh, kind of critical to the down, downstream translation or usability of any innovation. And then obviously these things like, you know, the economics, behavioral economics, uh, you know, what is the cost and benefit of doing something, doing something new? Um, and then, you know, what are the, what's the money? Uh, what's the money involved in this uh, so uh, d for disc methods, uh, uh, you know, participatory, co-design, stakeholder engagement, uh, you know, using some of the DNI frame frameworks that I mentioned earlier, you know, some kind of cross-fertilization with marketing and business approaches, uh, folks who may be a lot better at some of these things than DNI scientists, uh, systems engineering, behavioral economics, decision analysis, you know, people that do improvement science within or improvement work within the context of health systems often look at current state and key contextual drivers and make sure that the solution has a lot to do with consideration of those factors. And then we uh, ourselves are recently uh, really moving in the direction of communication science, really bringing people on board, uh, you know, who are expert in delivering messages in a kind of a user friendly way. And then arts, really kind of graphic design, you know, communication and, and optimizing uh, those channels uh, and rather than walls of text and, you know, complex charts and, and graphs and statistics. So I think those are all areas that really will support the translation or implementability of an intervention. 
Here's really a simple example of using the framework within the context of d for dish using the CIFR framework, where we examine the context, the characteristics of the intervention uh, and how that might fit within the inner setting, i.e. the organization, the outer setting, the, uh, you know, the context in which uh, the organization uh, is situated. So the community, the systems, the payers, the intervention, uh, the individu individuals involved. So, you know, what's their take on this intervention? Do they think they can deliver it uh, efficaciously? You know, are they open to it? Are they uh, are they skeptical? Uh, you know, do they have clout within the organization? Uh, you know, can they duck uh, duck this change until it passes? And maybe other attributes that you know reflect their likelihood of adoption. So D for this model also really, as I mentioned, really incorporates a lot of these implementation uh, aspects, DNI science within the context of the design. So really being able to do that as early on as possible uh, is seen as critical. It's a newer science, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for impact. Uh, I mentor many people and uh, it's the most exciting part of what I get to do. Uh, you know, being able to think uh, more systematically and precisely about this emerging precision implementation, uh, really being able to bring uh, health economics, uh, economic analysis into the issues of cost per strategy uh, and really the cost to achieve outcomes. So there's at work within, within uh, modeling or agent-based modeling or simulation modeling so that people can really understand the relative bang for the buck, if you will, of interventions, uh, candidate interventions and candidate implementation strategies to get to the outcome that you want. And then health equity, you know, where there is inequity, there is implementation failure. So uh, much work taking place uh, really across the country, understanding how best to measure inequity and equity, how best to uh, uh, use uh, uh, equity as a, as a framework within the context of design, uh, co-design and monitoring implementation strategies and so forth. So there's a lot happening there. I did want to share, uh, Beth mentioned Sunder, which is a local Stanford University uh, uh, grant, uh, network, people wrestling with, learning, struggling, adapting, applying, leading DNI efforts within the Stanford community. Uh, we actually do have members of the community who are not uh, connected with Stanford. Uh, so uh, please, if you're interested, uh, it meets bi-monthly, uh, the third Monday of the month. Uh, Alain Chakran Garneau, who works with me, is the point person for that, and we can get you that information. Also, I have a training program uh, with a few different stratified options for training and consultation focused on DNI. Again, Alain is your uh, key uh, person there. Dr. Darnell mentioned that you're, in addition to pain, there are many of you interested in substance use disorders or addiction. So we have a fellowship uh, in addiction and DNI science, which is an uh, adaptation of the Implementation Research Institute fellowship uh, in DNI, and uh, really the kind of fellowship where one can keep their day job and augment their uh, their training and experience uh, within a kind of a, a curated, mentored, individualized fellowship program that lasts one year, and we're we're about to launch. The first cohort of six individuals. Uh, by the way, applications are still coming in. So, uh, Alain is the point of contact for all things CDS, which is the name of the center, education and training uh, focused. So, here is a couple of uh, acknowledgments of funding through NIDA and NIH uh, for both of the centers that I think I referenced uh, earlier. And uh, again, two centers, one mission to get the best treatment possible to the people who need it most, and essentially using the newer science of DNI to make that possible in an equitable way. So with that, I'll stop. Uh, I think I'm not too bad on time and wanted to open it up for questions to the degree that there are any. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Mark. And I, I do want to invite people to chat in uh, their questions, either into the chat function or in the Q&A. Um, you can, I, I'm not sure if people can raise their hands or how, how that can work. Maybe Ashley can tell us, but 
while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I, I was curious, you know, a lot of the talk, which um, was really excellent, and I'm learning so much about uh, different models and, you know, really how to think about um, dissemination and implementation. Um, a lot of it, I, I was thinking sort of contextually within the, within like a clinical paradigm, you know, within a, I don't know, primary care or disseminating within an organization or an institution. I was curious how much work is being done or, or how much does your work intersect with um, dissemination and implementation outside of a medical context? Yeah, I think I think m most of the work we do is within the context of healthcare and healthcare delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there, there is increasingly, uh, you know, kind of user-centered design, you know, direct patient uh, kind of uh, translational approaches. So mm -hmm. uh, there, there are a few people who've kind of been dedicated uh, in that area, often around digital interventions, you know, mm -hmm. for uh, mental health conditions or even actually, I think pain management conditions, but I, I think that that field is actually lagging a little bit, and you know tends to to get right into marketing and communication science pretty quickly. There's a lot of opportunity there. I, I have colleagues that are working in the field of you know digital interventions and yeah, and direct marketing, and it, really the same framework still apply. The the uh -huh. the, the, the CFER could you know still easily apply you know, the character characterizations of barriers and facilitators using something like that, you know, the alignment of strategies based on, you know, what the barriers might be, and really the measurement of outcomes and measurement of outcomes, you know, could could be, let's say the proportion of people who, you know, who could use it, uh, you know, with a with a numerator of the proportion of people who actually do use it, or the people of mm -hmm. proportion of people who start using it, versus the proportion of people who continue to use it. So I, I think it's a, you know, the 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 the, the user-centered design world, the user-focused dissemination world, it, it, there's a lot happening on that front. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Ting Pun. Uh, how does patient preference fit into DNI? FDA PFDD initiative puts emphasis on patient preference study. Yeah, I think huge. Uh, it's it's interesting, and it's a great question. And it, I just want to share that we we adopted the CFER early on. Uh, yeah, it, it was originally published in two thousand nine, and uh, you know I, I stumbled upon it and thought, well, this is an interesting kind of way to inventory barriers and facilitators to a, 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 an innovation we were seeking to implement across you know primary care clinics and. You know, we used the CFER and we really found that the, the patient perspective was totally missing. There, it, it, there was a kind of a characteristics of the intervention dimension. There was a, there was a kind of a systems level dimension. There was kind of an organization or clinic level dimension, and then there was the provider dimension. But the patient dimension was totally missing. And actually, some of our colleagues here at Stanford, who I encouraged to adopt adopt the uh, the CFER in their improvement work said, Mark, what about the patient? And he said, oh yeah, what about the patient? So the new version of the CFER, the CFER 2.0 has actually incorporated in part stimulated by some of the Stanford uh, Evaluation Sciences Unit folks, uh, the improvement specialists uh, really have added the CFER 2.0 includes a patient dimension. So yes, I think, you know, patient, uh, you know, patient perspective is uh, critical to bring in early on uh, I mean, there are challenges sometimes when we think about, well, you know, how representative of patients, you know, is one or two or three or 10, mm -hmm. you know, what is the sufficient mass to really get a good, uh, a good sense of patient preference, uh, you know, to group patient preference, like, you know, are there differences, you know, by, you know, social determinants or, you know, potential uh, issues around equity or disparity, there's just something that's not a fit based on culture. Uh, so all of that kind of uh, initial groundwork is really, really important. How, how much of it uh, that you, you need to do, I'd say, you, you know, you probably can find with, within a timeline, but that's, that's where really good qualitative research, you know, individually and, you know, key informant interviews, whether, you know, uh, groups or focus groups are, are really important. There are a few, uh, 
ways of assessing acceptability, feasibility, uh, and appropriateness. There's a few measures uh, of that. Uh, Brian Weiner's is probably the easiest, but I, I, I would think that you, that's not a step that you would want to skip. Great, thank you. Um, Alex Butwick, fantastic talk. Can you provide some insider examples of processes or strategies for getting leadership administration buy-in for new strategies that you aim to implement, then study, especially outside non-academic community hospitals? Yeah, well, that's a great question. So uh, I, I, I think, uh, I think people that work in health systems are up against this all the time. And, you know, we, we know that leadership support is critical. Uh, you know, we know that there are different types of leaders. You know, there's, and people have actually studied this, you know, transformational leaders, which are the big picture people, uh, maybe inspirational leaders. Uh, there's, you know, transactional leaders, uh, you know, who are really kind of uh, hands on and aware and then laissez-faire leaders. And I think the strategies often uh, depend a lot on the type of leader we're talking about or the level of leadership within the organization. But there too, uh, to the degree that you have leadership support, uh, that that is a huge uh, barrier or facilitator. If it's absent, uh, you, you know, you're, it's an up, 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 uh, upstream swim. Uh, if you have it, uh, it can make everything everything really helpful. On the other hand, if a leader's not involved, if they really, you know, bless the project, if you will, uh, but are, aren't involved in the day to day, you know, they might miss a lot of uh, kind of subterfuge uh, in terms of the translation of things. So, what usually matters is, you know, is worth assessing. So part of what one needs to do is assess the values of leadership or the values of the organization. And what are the kind of things that really are influential? So, you know, the economic argument is really uh, often front and center within the context of non-academic or even academic health systems. So you really have to be thoughtful of, you know, what what is the... Uh, the cost benefit analysis of this. And, and, you know, the second piece is the, you know, the degree of complexity or, you know, the degree to which the, you know, the workforce is kind of clamoring for it. And, you know, be, being, you know, having the support of, you know, opinion leaders within the context of your kind of clinical workforce, you know, that this is something that everyone is, you know, sees the value in and really wants to support and really is, you know, kind of asking slash demanding leadership to help make it happen. The third is the, the voice of patient advocacy, you know, to the degree to which you can have patients and vocal patients and representative patients on board with the fact that, uh, you know, here's something that we want, here's something that we need, here's something that you, we, we would like you to offer. So I think, I think that's another level. I mean, actually, uh, you know, uh, another level that I found is really the competitive marketplace issue that if, if there's a sense that we could do this and we could really be innovators and seen as offering something that's unique and special. Uh, you know, that that is kind of a competitive, uh, you know, kind of a PR marketplace advantage. So I, I, I've actually seen that, uh, you know, and been able to, you know, help present that as a strategy, you know, engaging uh, health system leadership. So I think all of those things, and again, if you if you look at the the C for it kind of inventories the different things that might be more or less important to a leader. But having that conversation early on is just really important. Uh, and 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 you know buy in. Some people don't like the term buy in. Uh, I, I don't see a, a whole lot against it. But I think we you know you definitely need uh, those kind of alliances to move move things forward, especially around sustainability. Especially if you have a grant funded project. Or once your grant is over, the money disappears and the incentives disappears. You're really going to need the leadership to support the continuation of the thing. Great point. Um, two more questions, if you have time for that. Uh, outcome measure. This is from Alexander Beletsky. Outcome measurement and development of new outcome instruments has really taken off in recent multiple fields of medicine. What goes into the selection of the appropriate outcome measurement instruments for DNI? That's a great. That's a great question. And 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 one of the things that I always think about is you know how can you demonstrate current state. And you know, if, if there's if there's a current state gap that you can measure, that is ultimately the thing that you want to use as your outcome measure. You you want to move the needle 
on that current state uh, kind of indicator. So it could be that, you know, your indicator is something simple like, you know, a vaccination rate within a county or a vaccination rate within a state. So, you know, the first order of business is, you know, obtaining a good measure of that gap. You know, if, if it's 80% uh, goal or 90% goal or even 100% goal, uh, you know, what is that, you know, what is that metric and, you know, what are you doing to move that metric? And so uh, uh, there's a, oftentimes we tend to skip a good measure of the current state. We, you know, we resort to, you know, uh, aggregate EHR data. We resort to claims analysis. We resort to surveys, kind of qualitative anecdotal information about what a gap is. You know, if it's a specific in intervention or specific innovation, you know, we really want to, again, get a numerator and denominator of the opportunity and the, you know, the numerator being the degree to which that opportunity is, is being achieved or missed. So uh, the outcome indicator to me is always, uh, it always is kind of a pursuant of reducing or eliminating a gap. And it could be, that's where you find issues around equity and disparity, where if, if the gap is more pronounced, among certain subgroups, then your your goal is really to figure that out and to design or adapt your intervention so that it's more acceptable uh, or develop a, you know a series of implementation strategies to reach that population that you're currently missing. So it's a great question, and uh, yeah, I mean we like implementation outcomes to be fairly consistent across projects. Um, you know, using the, the blood pressure example earlier, that's a great one because everyone's using the same measure. Uh, you know, maybe in pain management, there are other common measures, but I think in implementation, you know, we've been wrestling with uh, kind of moving yardsticks or different yardsticks for projects. So the degree to which every project has its own yardstick, that's one thing, it makes it hard to pull data, to do meta-analyses, to actually compare implementation strategies across projects, you know, and what we're often left with is, you know, kind of research case studies or health system case studies that are hard to draw generalizations from. So we're, we're working in that area, but I would say in response to your question, measure your gap and then base your outcome on the, the change in that gap. Great, thank you. Um, one last question from Mario. I see similarities to the intervention mapping approach or the IM approach, Bartholomew, 2016. Have you taken it into account in your work? Yeah, I think there's a, colleagues of ours that have used intervention mapping quite a bit within the context of implementation strategy mapping. And in fact, the PALS original work uh, started out with 73 discrete implementation strategies, which you know kind of reminded me of you know, the periodic table of high school chemistry and it, it, it kind of interesting, but really not useful, uh, at least with the kind of work that I do. Uh, so uh, they, they used some concept mapping work to reduce the number of, of, of strategies into something a little bit more manageable, but actually present, you know, those strategies and options within the context of the, the uh, kind of interactions with key stakeholders to co-design uh, implementation uh, strategies within the context of a project. So that that's the area that I found that in, intervention uh, intervention mapping, concept mapping, implementation strategy mapping is, is being used now. Um, it does raise, and I think this relates to the earlier question, if, if it's entirely driven by your key stakeholders, you wonder that, you know, to what degree you're you're deviating from you know what might be an e more evidence-based plan so that often involves again you know it's just really good uh, you know good navigation and you know weighing of options based on what we know uh, in terms of the evidence so but I, but I think intervention mapping uh, there is work being done uh, I don't have a citation handing handy but it would be based on the work of Byron Powell Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McGovern. I'm aware we're right at time. Um, so I want to thank you for a great lecture on a really important and interesting topic. Um, thank you all for joining us for this month's Stanford Pain Relief Innovations Lab lecture. 